I want to begin here. Uh, partly it was an excuse just to include it. It's my, it's probably my favorite picture ever taken by mankind, and I would maybe argue with anyone that it may even be the most important in terms of really demonstrating to us the vastness of the rest of the cosmos. I think that's very much in line with maybe what Carl Sagan would have said. And this was an image taken by the Hubble Space Telescope in 1995, which as we'll find out is kind of a nice accident with something else I'll discuss in this talk. But as you can see, almost all of these tiny points of light here are actually individual galaxies. And while this may look like a huge patch of sky, it's in fact a tiny, tiny fraction of it. So if I took a tennis ball and I put it out at 100 meters away from me, almost the length of a football field, the little tiny area in the sky that it would block out is about this size. And so that's how big the universe is, and that's how much stuff is in it. So it's vast and it's huge. Like I said, each one of those points of light are a galaxy. This is our own galaxy, or at least an artist's rendition of it, because certainly we can't go outside of it yet and take a photo. If you can see, the text is quite small, but sort of down from the bottom, there's a little place where it says sun. So somewhere in there is our own star, and around our own star, we have our planets. Now, these objects are very familiar to us. They're very familiar to us from even from our ancient cultures, because from the perspective of, let's say, an ancient mariner thousands of years ago, looking out into the sky and trying to navigate at night, the moon and the sun, of course, played very important roles. And then there were the stars. But amongst these stars were a couple stars which actually moved separate than all the other ones. And these are, of course, the planets, or at least the visible planets that they could see with their naked eye. And in fact, the word that we call planets, planets is uh, from the Greek meaning wandering star. So it's quite appropriate. Now, one other thing I want you to take away from this slide um, is that there seems to be an order in how these planets are arranged. There's these small rocky planets close to the star, our sun. And then further out, there's these large planets, which I will call gas giants, colloquially known as gas giants. And then further, further out, we have what I would call planetary underachievers. So you'll notice maybe this doesn't quite match your children's placemat version because Pluto isn't there. Um, it falls into that category among with a bunch of other objects. And they're sort of the remnants of planetary formation. So another thing I'd like you to notice about the solar system, which is depicted more clearly in this picture, is that almost everything, like I said, aside from Pluto, this uh, planetary underachiever, is orbiting in a nearly circular orbit. Everybody's going the same direction. And they're in what looks like a disk. And this disk cuts directly through, you can't necessarily see it in this picture, uh, the equator of the star itself. So our own sun is also rotating. And the planets are rotating in the same direction. The question is, from an astrophysical standpoint, is there a reason for this? Is there some sort of physics and chemistry principles which gives rise to the structure that we see? So the actual fundamentals of chemistry and physics are very, very well understood. But taking those and shaping them into an astrophysical model where you've cut out all the unnecessary parts is a very difficult task. And astronomers have been trying to do that for some time, in part because planets are very near and dear to our heart. And they've developed something which seems to actually do a very good job. It's this core accretion model, as it's known. And there's a bunch of stages of where different physical phenomena sort of take over. And it gives something which looks like our solar system, which seems very, very convincing, because that's the only data point that we know. And from that, what else is out there? Is it possible for us to find other planets, number one? And number two, if it is, what is our theory, or at least our ideas of how planetary formation going to actually hold up when we encounter these new systems. Now, I would like to pause here and just state that 50 years ago, maybe even 25 years ago, you could very much argue that at least not within 100 years or maybe 200 years would we ever have found what's known as exoplanets, planets around other stars. And that has actually changed, and it's changed in very, very dramatic fashion. Okay, So you can go online and you can check the exoplanet archive which is maintained by JPL and Caltech, uh, courtesy of NASA. And it will give you an updated number of confirmed exoplanets, multi-planet systems, and Kepler candidates, 
Kepler will come up a little bit later. And of course, the number is quite vast. I mean, there's plenty of these systems, and it's not that these are all the systems in our galaxy. Uh, far from it. They're just some of the nearest ones, which we've been lucky enough to get good measurements of. Right? And you can make estimates of what the total population is in our own galaxy, and thereby in other galaxies, and it's absolutely tremendous. And so not only have we seen them, but we have an indication that they're very, very, very plentiful. Okay, so how do we actually take these measurements, these measurements which tell us that there's other planets out there? So the first thing that you would imagine is just somehow looking for them, like in the way that you look at other stars or you look at nebulae or other galaxies. Now that turns out to be too hard because stars are very bright. And these planets are relatively close to these other stars. And so in order to image something which is very faint next to something very bright, you, uh, you have a problem. So an often used analogy is like trying to look and find a firefly flying around a lighthouse. So it's very, very difficult. And so you have to resort to more crafty techniques. So one of those techniques is called um, radial velocity. And essentially where this comes from is that as the planet orbits the star, the planet also pulls on the star. And even though the planet is much smaller than the star, the star does move, and even though it only moves a very small amount. And so if you have sensitive enough measurements, what you can detect is not actually the movement of the star itself, but what you detect is you detect how the color of the star changes as the star moves towards you and away from you. So this is what's known as the Doppler shift, and it happens in a lot of wave phenomena. So for instance, the classic example is when a car drives by you, you sort of hear the sound with increased frequency as it comes towards you and then lower frequency as it goes away. So it's right? So it makes that sound. So similarly, the star, the light from the star will become blue shifted as it comes towards you and will become red shifted as it goes away from you. And so if you take a bunch of pictures of these stars and you analyze the color that's coming away from them over some time period, what you'll see is you'll see some nearly sinusoidal curve which will tell you that the star is moving around. And if you have very, very accurate measurements, you can determine how big um, and how far away the planet is that's, that's uh, perturbing the star. Okay, so that's one of the techniques. Now a second one is called um, transit. And effectively what you do here is you actually look at the amount of light coming to the telescope, to the observer. And what you're hoping is that you're hoping that a planet actually crosses in front of the star and makes a shadow. So you can't actually see the star as a whole disk. You see it basically as a point of light. And really what you're doing and what this graph is supposed to represent is it's supposed to represent the amount of light that's coming to you and it takes a little dip for some period of time and then goes back as the planet crosses in front of the star. So you first have to be lucky because you have to hope that the planets orbiting around a star are aligned in such a way that they block out the light. But if you look at many, many stars, you can get lucky occasionally. So this is another common method. And there's others, but these have been the dominating factors for most of the discoveries. OK? So just uh, another piece of data, which you can take from the Exoplanet Archive, is the number of confirmed detections, as opposed to just detections, which are a little looser. Um, so these have had additional data to support that these really are planets and not just glitches in the signals. And as you can see, there's a very, very striking curve basically starting from around near 1995 when the Hubble Space Telescope took, took that beautiful image. And we've gone from knowing a, a handful of planets, which was in, its, in and of itself an amazing discovery that we could discover these things at all, and now we just have hundreds and now thousands. And as you can see, there's this extra big um, bar on the far right in 2014 coming from mostly transits, which comes from this one telescope, uh, the Kepler Space Telescope, which looks out at a section of stars, thousands of stars, and just stares at them and hopes that planets cross in front of them. Okay. So here's another graph, um, which I'm, I'm, I'm not sure if this is the first log log plot that's been in a TED talk, but um, sorry about that. <laughs> And, uh, and as you can see, um, on the bottom axis, we have period. So this is the days, how long it takes the planets to go around the host star. And then we have mass in terms of Jupiter masses. And so in order to make this thing more legible, I put some sample periods and also masses of various 
of our, of our own planet. So we have Me is Mercury, E for Earth, J, Jupiter, S, Saturn, and N, Neptune. And as you can see, if you just make sort of a direct comparison, there are some very, very crazy planets in here. So for instance, near of a period of about, let's say, three days, there are planets which have a mass 10 times the mass of Jupiter. And so before, we had this nice clean picture of star, rocky planets, gas giants. And here's a gas giant, which is way, way inside the orbit of Mercury, right next to the star. And it's huge. It's 10 times the mass of Jupiter. And Mercury, for instance, has an orbital period of around 90 days. So just to give you a point of comparison. So these planets are crazy. There's all kinds of things which you never would have expected. And they're just there. And we don't know why they're there. OK, here's another graph essentially um, demonstrating the same thing. Like I said, our solar system is pretty nice. It's fairly circular. Um, here, eccentricity is a measure of ellipticity. So eccentricity of 0 is perfectly circular. Eccentricity of nearly 1 is like an extreme, extreme ellipse. And as you can see, there's plenty of very, very, very elliptical stars. And as you can see, almost everybody in our solar system is piled down near 0. Mercury, the closest to uh, the sun has some decent amount of eccentricity, but certainly not like any of these objects. So our model also told us that, yeah, generically, we'll also get something nice and circular. And here, we're seeing that almost anything goes. Okay. Now, just one point of warning about some of these plots is that there is a selection bias, meaning that these techniques which find planets, some planets are easier to find than others. So for instance, with radial velocity, you can find planets which are very large close to the star. And that's why some of the first planets we found were these huge, what's known as hot Jupiters, these big ones close by. But we didn't even think they could exist. So uh, that's startling in and of itself. And also, understanding your selection bias, you can still get a good sense of what the other populations of planets are out there that you're just missing, because it's difficult to measure them. So the future. One thing that I find very, very exciting, and I think my, uh, my inner child is, uh, is also very excited about, is that there's a possibility not only of directly inferring these, the presence of these planets, but maybe even directly imaging them. And so this is something which, in the beginning of the talk, I told you, well, look, it's impossible. It's like looking for a flyer fly around a lighthouse. But what you can do is, if you're very, very smart, you can you know, sort of take your thumb, and you can block the lighthouse, and then maybe the firefly will be a little more visible. And so that's what people are trying to do, and they're using something called a coronagraph to block the, 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 the light of the star. And it mostly works, but there's still some residual bits, as you can see. And what I'm going to show you is a very, very clever technique where they use the coronagraph to block the star. They take a long exposure at a certain frequency, a certain color. And then they do that over a series of frequencies. And then they make, essentially, a movie out of this frequency, out of this uh, sort of series of frequencies. And I'm going to play this movie for you. So it's very short and vaguely psychedelic. But what I want you to notice is as we're, as we're going through different frequencies, there's these spots that radiate outwards. These spots are artifacts of my instruments. They're not real, right? But there is a spot that doesn't move where the arrow is conveniently pointing for you. It's kind of hard to see, especially from the back. But maybe some of you can pick it out, OK? That's a planet, right? And there is a, there's a sort of a, a predictive nature of these spots as they move. And so what you can do is you can use fancy computer vision algorithms to actually remove all that junk that we had to sort of watch in that video. And then you can get an image like this. And you can see that these objects are actually the ones, like I said before, they're not the ones that move. Those are real planets. So these are some of my colleagues who've done this work. They are from the Na Museum of Natural History, sorry, the American Museum of Natural History. And um, with, some other, uh, with some other institutions. And for instance, this is a star, HR8799, a very sexy name. But around it, they were able to image uh, four separate planets. And it is at the relatively close distance of 128 light years. So that's it for maybe that's a taste of future observations to come. Uh, additionally, there is also the possibility of being confronted by the fact that we clearly had no idea what we were talking about. Right? So 
it's not like we didn't understand physics and it's not like we didn't understand chemistry. But taking those two things and putting them together and coming up with a simplified model which is, you know, uh, tractable, if you will, is a very, very difficult task. And now that we're confronted by basically the rich possibilities in nature, we realize that things are maybe more complicated than we, than we supposed. And so we need to go back to the drawing board. Maybe the, the basic idea is still there, but maybe there's some complicated late time dynamics where planets are getting scattered off other planets and they're doing this really incredible dance for us. And maybe our solar system is you know, relatively boring compared to the possibilities out there. So I think the two messages I wanna convey here is that number one, we're in a very exciting time. I think certainly within our lifetime, maybe even in the next five years, we will be able to find a companion Earth. Uh, and hopefully very soon after that, we'll be able to take spectroscopic images of it and see what it's made of, what's in its atmosphere, what kind of components live there, chemical composition. And secondly, there's just a lot of work to be done, and this is like good science. This is how science makes progress, right? We have to be confronted by new results and confusing times. So thank you very much, I appreciate it. Yeah.